the Carlson Middle School bowling. It's the fifth time as an overall story teller. Um, former Carlson Bowling City record holder, 864 series. And what's really interesting is he recently apparently donated a sample of bodily fluids. <laughs> we're not going to ask which ones. <laughs> to 23 of me in front of a long lost relative of Benjamin Franklin. True. True. Wow. Just found out today. <laughs> I don't feel more patriotic, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, let's welcome um, Bridget Ware. For the record, I don't like kites or lightning. <laughs> Sorry. You ever meet somebody that puts you in a good mood for a couple of days? Didn't have to be, I mean, anyone off the street. Yes. But in my case, it was somebody famous. Uh, not my first run-in with somebody famous, not unlike uh, the beaver. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, it was called C2E2 down in Chicago. It's a Chicago Entertainment Expo. It's like a Comic-Con, the closest we're gonna get here in the Midwest. I met somebody there that put me in a good mood for days. But it wasn't my first run-in with celebrities. So before I get to that story, I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me in Milwaukee, 2010, something like that. Anyways, it was called ZombieCon. It's all about horror movies. I'm gonna start at the end. Uh, so the best thing about meeting celebrities is things that happen in the bar afterwards. Uh, so after the second day of the convention was over, I went to the bar to drink to try to figure out what had happened during the previous weekend. Uh, and I sat next to two guys. Uh, one of them was named Tom Atkins and the other guy's name was Charles Cipher. If you guys don't know who they are, I'll tell you. Tom Atkins was in the first Halloween and Halloween part three. Uh, he was also in Lethal Weapon. He played Mr. Huntsacker, who is the old guy that killed somewhere in the middle of the movie, spoiler alert. Uh, he was also in an episode of MASH. That's how I remember him. Uh, Charles Cipher was also in the first Halloween. Uh, he was also in a movie called The Fog. Uh, but more importantly, he was in a movie called Major League. So I sat in the bar next to these two guys. They recognized me from the convention. Uh, we started chit-chatting. Uh, I told Tom, I said, listen, all the horror movies you've been in have been great, but you were in the swamp. You talked to Hawkeye. Uh, BJ and Colonel Potter. I remember that episode clearly because MASH is one of my favorite shows of all time. So I started chatting with him. I started telling him lines from the show because I'm a nerd. Uh, so we started drinking Jack and Coke to be precise. I remember it all. Uh, and I told Mr. Cypress and now Charles, uh, you were in, of course, Halloween, but Major League was where it was at. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. When I was a kid, my dad took me to County Stadium where they were filming Major League back in the day. It was a movie around the, around the Cleveland Indians. Charlie Sheen was the star. So they were very impressed with my knowledge of stupid stuff, especially about their two movies. Uh, and I asked them, how did, you, how did you two get to be traveling buddies? And they said, well, we share an agent. So that's curious. How does one get to be an agent in Hollywood? So, well, a kid who's our agent, we owe a favor to their father and he's starting an agency and there we go. So, but you, you know more about us than our own agent does. So I tell you, if you ever move to Hollywood, you got a job with us, we'll totally sign on to be your clients. <laughs> what? Okay, so we had a few more drinks, we had a few more stories. Then it was decided clearly that no good deal comes out of a bar while drinking, <laughs> clearly. So that was the time I almost became an agent for two stars in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, later, earlier that weekend, uh, the main draw to ZombieCon was an actress by the name of Dee Wallace. Let me tell you who she is. Uh, she's the mom from E.T. Uh, she was also in Cujo. Uh, she was in The Howling, amongst many other TV shows. She has a career that spans many. So I had a special pass that got me in before the unclean. Uh, they, sold 50, they sold 50 of these passes, so I needed to get my pass early so I can get in before the crowds. Uh, so they only sold 10 out of these 50. And out of the 10, only four of us showed up. So I didn't have a lot of competition to get to the stars before everybody else did. So I went right to D. Wallace and I, all I could do was thank her. She signed a whole bunch of stuff. Here's uh, my signed copy of Cujo DVD. Yes, show and tell time. Uh, she was really, really nice. And for some reason we clicked. Uh, I don't know how or I don't know why. 
uh, I know strange things happen between me and Dee, and I'll, I'll tell you what happened. So I'm walking down the hallways of the convention, and all of a sudden I can hear somebody running behind me, and all of a sudden I tripped out of my shoes. Dee Wallace had stepped on my heels and got me out of my shoe. She laughed and said, ooh, flat tire, and went right around me. Uh, odd behavior, couldn't figure that out. Then I was at another table buying a movie, and specifically I was buying a Russ Meyer movie. If anyone knows who Russ Meyer is, he specifically made movies with chesty women. His movies are hard to find. You had to go through his production company to get copies of his movies. They were not widely released. So I got a copy of a movie called Faster Pussycat Kill Kill Kill. It's kind of a western. <laughs> kind of. Anyways, I'm buying a copy of the movie. And somebody behind me is hugging me and whispering in my ear, what are you buying me? Uh, that was Dee Wallace whispering in my ear. This is just odd. I couldn't figure out what happened, what I did, or what went wrong. I don't know what the deal was. Later on that day, uh, there was a special meet and greet after the first day of the convention. Uh, and then again, there's only four of us. And I did my homework and all the people that were gonna be there, so I was a complete and total nerd. I knew every celebrity, I knew every movie, I knew every scene, I knew their lines, I studied. I knew what I was talking about. The other people who were there that had special passes had no clue what was going on. So I was the draw to the convention because at that time the celebrities were starting to ask us questions. Like, hey, is it your first time at a con? How did you get here? What's your favorite movie? So I'm banging off the answers. I sat next to a guy, during this little meet and greet, I sat next to a guy called Sid Haig. If anyone knows who he is, uh, he's recently been in Rob Zombie movies, and specifically House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, but his career goes way back to the 60s. He was in Gunsmoke. Uh, he did a lot of black exploitation movies with Pam Greer, like The Birdcage, Coffee. He's been in a lot of stuff. Sid and I had a very nice conversation. We talked, we talked, we chatted, everything was great. That was over. So that was, the, that was the end of day one. And as the days ended, I find myself gravitating towards the bar, which is where most things happen after conventions. You go to the bar and you start drinking. So I sat at the corner of the bar and two other guys come in who recognized me from the convention and their names were Scott Redinger and David M.G. They're not so much known, they were in a movie called Dawn of the Dead. There was, was a sequel to uh, Night of the Living Dead. They were famous because that movie was the first zombie movie that happened inside of a shopping mall that started the craze of people hoarding in grocery stores and shopping malls for the zombie apocalypse that's clearly going to happen. This was the movie that started all that. So we get to talk and they sit next to me and we're chit-chatting and drinking. I drank a lot of Jack Daniels that weekend. It's amazing I remember anything. <laughs> but we sat and we started drinking and I'm watching the clock. I'm like, you guys got to have a, there's a special dinner just for the celebrities, just for the people who have merchandise booths, you have to be at this dinner. It's on the itinerary. And I said, wow, I don't, we're having a good time chatting with you. We don't want to go. I'm like, yeah, but I think you have, I think you have to be there. I said, well, doesn't your past get you in this dinner? Said, no, my past does not get me in that dinner. I'm one of the unclean. I don't get to go in there. I said, tell you what, we like chatting with you so much. We're going to bring you to this dinner. Hell or high water, we're going to get you in there. That's funny. It's cute that you say that, but it's not going to happen. So I lead them to the ballroom where all the actions happen and just the celebrities and so forth. And uh, there's a petty functionary with the clipboard that tells me I can't get in. So they're like, no, no, you don't understand. Check the list again. Greg's on the list. So after 10 minutes of tongue lashing, I get into the dinner. Now the guy who was playing the music is another, I'm going to call him entertainer because he's only had maybe a minute of screen time. His name is Ari Lyman. And those of you who don't know that, and probably many of you don't, he was the first Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th series. And specifically the first movie. Now in the first movie, the mom was the killer. Spoiler alert, sorry. Uh, but at the end of the movie, there's a scene, a little kid comes out of the water and drags the main girl into the bottom of Crystal Lake. That was Ari Lyman. It was his five seconds of screen time, and he's made a career off of that. Good for him. So his band was playing, his band's called The First Jason. <laughs> Turns out not going to be my first run-in with Ari Lyman. Uh, during the convention, uh, I, I met him, got his autograph, all kind of cool stuff. And I said, geez, the only other Ari that I know of is Ari Lyondike. He was an indie, indie car driver. So just off of that, we had a short conversation with the name Ari and where it came from. Uh, then he later said he was going to try to get me in that dinner. I said, that's, that's great, that's cool, it's never going to happen. But later that night, here I am. 
but that's not my first run-in with Ari. I would later meet him several years later at a bar in Milwaukee called the Metal Grill, where his band was playing at an event that I was partially, I was with the people that were hosting the event, and our merchandise table was next to his merchandise table, and he remembered everything. So he would always be disappearing to, he would go to what he would call safety meetings. He wanted to know if I could watch his merchandise table for him. I said, okay, that's no problem. So four or five safety meetings later, he'd come and go, come and go. And he actually bought me a shirt for being a cool cat and watching his merchandise table. But the last safety meeting before his band played, he invited me out to. It's like, hey, dude, you should come to our safety meeting. Said, that's ridiculous. I don't, I don't have a thing to do with safety in this place. Uh, I'm not going to be on stage with you. I don't know what to tell you. He goes, no, 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 come on, dude. It'd be cool. Okay. So I go with the first Jason Voorhees to the safety meeting, and turns out they just go to his giant van and smoke weed before the show. That's a safety meeting. When the first Jason offers you weed, I guess, I'm not going to tell you if I inhaled or not, but I went out to the van anyways. So getting back to the dinner time, uh, David and Scott, I sat at their table for a little while. Uh, then all of a sudden, somebody's arms got behind me, and guess who? It was Dee Wallace. She was very happy to see me at this dinner because I was I was the lone crasher of the party. No one else got in here. None of the other guests got in, but somehow I got in. So she invited me to her table. And at her table was Sid Haig and another actress by the name of Scout Taylor Compton. Scout Taylor Compton was in Rob Zombie's versions of the first two Halloween movies, but she was also in a biographical picture about the Runaways, where she portrayed Lita Ford. That movie was out a couple of years ago. Anyways, uh, after a couple of drinks were flowing, they got me on the dance floor, and I recommend not looking for this, but somewhere out there, there's videotape of me dancing with Dee Wallace and Scott Taylor Compton in the middle of this convention with Ari Lyman's band playing in the background. It was just, I needed more alcohol to figure out what was happening. So uh, Dee says she wants to buy me a beer. I'm like, I'm already happy in the bag, let's go. So we're at the bar and I'm ordering drinks, and that's when it happened. I felt something warm and wet in my ear. Uh, that was the tongue of Dee Wallace in that ear. I didn't have long to ask myself a lot of questions real quickly because I didn't know where this was going to go. So the devil on my shoulder said, dude, it's Dee Wallace. Get a couple of drinks, take her back to her room, have sex with Dee Wallace. You'll have stories for generations. Okay. Time to ask the angel on my shoulder. Angel, well now what should I do? Dude, it's Dee Wallace. Have a couple of drinks. Take a <laughs> have sex with her. Have stories for generations. Well, none of that happened. After a couple of more drinks, I slowly exited the situation, not really knowing where that was going to go. Uh, so now every time I see a Dee Wallace movie, I have a smile on my face that some people don't understand. And I'll explain. It's just another well-built ship that crossed my wake. <laughs> when I see the Dawn of the Dead movies, I always have a smile. Hey, I know those two guys. When I see the Friday the 13th movies, hey, I, I knew that kid. I, I, I smoked weed with that kid. I didn't inhale. Shh, quiet. <laughs> so in one weekend, I almost became uh, an agent. I almost had sex with Dee Wallace. Uh, it was just a weird, wild weekend. That was one, that was one weekend. So these are things that I think of in the darkest of times when you're having a bad day, you can think of these things and have a smile brought to your face. Uh, now the event that happened just a couple of weeks ago in C2E2, I met someone and I have witnesses to what happened. Uh, somebody who's been entertaining me for the last 18 years, it's gotta be close that the show started maybe, what? 99. 90, 99, the show started in 99. Uh, I used to be a bouncer at the boathouse uh, right across the street. Uh, and I used to get out really late at night, three, four in the morning. I would get home, pass out on the couch. So Sunday mornings, I would put the TV on and I'd start channel flipping. And eventually I'd land on Nickelodeon uh, and where they were running marathons of SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Think what you want about SpongeBob. It's a love-hate relationship, I totally understand. But at C2E2, I met Tom Kenny, the voice of one SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Uh, and he signs to Greg, the king of the Goofy Goobers. Uh, the Goofy Goobers is a fan club in Bikini Bottom from a restaurant called the Weenie Hut. And I got a chance to thank Tom Kenny for entertaining me for all these years. For all the Sunday mornings, I woke up tired of dealing with drunk people 
and everything else you can imagine being squared at, avoiding fights, who knows? SpongeBob was the best way to decompress out of that day. And I had a chance to tell him that, uh, and, he, and he laughed. He laughed at my story. I made Tom Kenny laugh. I made SpongeBob laugh. Nothing's ever gonna top that. And then I told him the plot of my favorite episode, and he agreed it was one of his favorites too. It's an episode, it's called Squidward's Day Off, uh, where Mr. Krabs gets a bump on the head and has to go to the hospital, leave Squidward in charge. Squidward doesn't want to do crap. He makes SpongeBob do all the work. So Squidward exits himself and keeps thinking that SpongeBob is going to burn the crusty crab down. So I'm explaining this to SpongeBob. Like he knew he should know he did the voice. Like he gets it. Yet he still laughed at my story. Uh, the, uh, the other person that I met there, uh, she was Princess Vespa from Spaceballs. Anyone here seen Spaceballs? I got to tell Princess Vespa, uh, Daphne Zuniga, I got to tell her my favorite scene when she's shot and they shot her hair. It's like, you shot my hair, son of a bitch. She said she made up that line in the spot. I did not know that. I did not know that. So these are the things, now when I get to see these, uh, the TV show, when I get to see MASH, I'm like, I, I knew that guy. When I get to see the Friday the 13th first movie, yeah, man, that was a cool time. I remember all these things because I'm an avid watcher of TV and movies. It, when you have a hard life or you have a hard day or what have you, you usually sit back and what's the phrase nowadays, Netflix and chill. It's what you do, you watch your favorite movies. And now I get to have really cool memories of some of the people that I met in some of the oddball situations. D. Wallace's tongue in my ear for some reason. <laughs> Just want to say quickly now that wasn't my end of my dealings with day Wa with d wallace that next morning uh, the the second day of the convention she asked me where i'd slipped off to said she had a really great a really great night I said that's cool i didn't know where that was going to go so i left uh, so years later i get to be on a radio show here in town the mothership connection was on am 1050 wlip and we're looking to try to get guests uh, and i was at barnes and noble one day and i saw d wallace's book She's like a psychic healer, it's what she does. So I bought her book, and on the back of the book was an email for her publicist. And I wanted to send her publicist an email. Maybe she wants to, maybe she remembers that weird night. So I sent her publicist uh, an email explaining to her, leaving out the ear detail about what I met Dee and how we met, all that kind of stuff. I uh, left all my information, uh, email, cell phone, house phone, the whole deal. Uh, two days later, I got a call on my cell phone. It was Dee Wallace herself. She called me from her own cell phone. She remembered. She remembered everything down to the ear detail. And I got her to be a guest on the show, uh, not once, but twice. Uh, so again, just out of a weird night led to, I mean, we've now known each other for a while. I don't have her cell phone number anymore now, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that was just a really odd thing to happen. And again, it's another, weird, it's another nice memory to have when you're having a bad day. Everyone's met someone or seen something that you draw on. It's like, man, this day sucks. So your mind starts to wander and something good that happened to get you through that day. Now I'm glad I have memories like that to get me through the bad days. Thank you.